Hello, I'm Father Mitch Packo, and welcome to EWTN Live, where we bring you guests from around the world. Tonight, we've got a very special show for you. It has a particularly deep connection to Mother Angelica. Our guest is EWTN producer, filmmaker, and documentarian, Michael O'Neill. And you may have seen Michael's work on the network in shows like The Miracle Hunter and the series called They Might Be Saints. Well, tonight we are going to premiere the newest episode of They Might Be Saints. And this time we focus on a woman named Rhoda Wise from Canton, Ohio who led a 19-year-old girl to a healing experience with our Lord and the little flower, St. Therese of this year. That healing changed Rita Rizzo's life forever. And she would eventually become known as Mother Angelica. She went on to found the Eternal Word Television Network. And we hope that you enjoy this special story of Rhoda Wise. And after it finishes, we'll talk with producer Michael O'Neill to get his insights about a woman whose devotion to our blessed Lord Jesus and to the little flower had such a profound impact on Mother Angelica. So please take a look. Rhoda Wise was a disciple in the true sense of the word. And Jesus says, deny yourself, follow in my footsteps, and pick up your cross. And um, Rhoda Wise not only picked up her crosses, but she kissed the cross again and again. She was very, very patient, and she loved the people that came. She loved them, and she wanted to help them. And she allowed that to happen for the sake of giving witness to the meaning of suffering uh, that she was going through for the Lord. I think our Lord um, always wants to remind us of all he suffered. He wanted to reinforce the Fatima message through Rhoda. And it was the stepping stone to Mother Angelica and EWTN. It, it um, one grace to another. From miracle workers to martyrs, to those ordinary people living extraordinary lives of heroic virtue. These are the people that make us wonder if someday they might be saints. Rhoda was born, Rhoda Greer, on February 22, 1888, in Cadiz, Ohio, to bricklayer Eli Greer and his wife Anna, the sixth of their eight children. When she was two years old, the Greer family moved to Wheeling, West Virginia, where she was raised as a Protestant. Rhoda married George Wise in 1917, and the couple continued to live in the Canton area, and being unable to conceive children, they adopted two daughters, one of whom died in infancy. George Wise was an alcoholic and changed jobs frequently, resulting in financial hardship and embarrassment for the family. He ran out of money, you know, and then he had a, a severe drinking party. He was a full-fledged alcoholic. The Wise family lived at seven different addresses by the early 1930s. They were occupying a three-room house near the Canton City Dump. Beginning in the early 1930s, Rhoda Wise developed serious health problems 
including a 39-pound ovarian cyst that had to be surgically removed, and a broken foot which failed to heal properly and caused her to suffer pain and difficulty in walking. The tumor was a benign tumor of the ovary, but it was large. And something you can imagine, 39-pound tumor uh, sitting in your pelvis, your lower abdomen, that's going to take a lot of space. It, you know, it's, it's, it's even bigger than you, know, you would have with a baby. That's a difficult surgery to go through. And in, in order to remove it, of course, you have to open the abdomen, be able to take it out, and, and then sew her back. Uh, you know, together. Rhoda was hospitalized frequently and underwent a number of operations. From 1931 through 1939, she had undergone, I believe, 14 surgeries and, and some other uh, bouts of uh, bowel obstructions that weren't surgically treated, that were treated more conservatively. During a 1936 stay at a Kent hospital operated by the Sisters of Charity of St. Augustine, she befriended some of the sisters who taught her to pray the rosary and told her about St. Therese of Lisieux. Rhoda began to pray regularly to St. Therese and also became devoted to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. The sisters you know, would introduce her to certain devotions that touch our Catholic faith, like the Holy Rosary. She was open to grace, and it's almost as if the more she, she suffered, the more inquisitive she became that became the, the the door openers to everything you know and she became more and more passionate in her desire uh, to become a catholic in december 1938 rhoda decided to convert to catholicism and was received into the catholic church in january of 1939. she was sent home by the doctors saying we can really do nothing more for you. In May 1939, Rhoda was diagnosed with a terrible stomach cancer and was discharged from the hospital and sent home to die. She did suffer intensely sometimes, but never complained. The suffering lended her to prayer, to contemplation, to acceptance. Rhoda Wise claimed that she received an apparition of Jesus Christ on May 28, 1939 at her home during which Jesus was said to tell her that he would come again with St. Therese the following month on June 28th. From all reports, there were no other signs of psychosis. She wasn't delusional, she wasn't paranoid, she wasn't grandiose, she wasn't mixed up in her thinking, she wasn't illogical, she didn't make up words that nobody knew the meaning of, she wasn't loose. Everything surrounded these visitations. Rhoda reported that Jesus and St. Therese both appeared on June 28th, and during their visit, cured her of her stomach cancer, including healing a large open wound on her abdomen caused by her multiple surgeries. St. Therese was the one who motioned for Rhoda to take the bandage off of her abdomen. And she put her hand there and said, you've been tried in the fire and not found wanting. Faith cures all things. And her abdomen was completely cured. She had been walking and stepped into a sewer, and it broke her foot. And in the process of trying to heal the foot, she was placed in a cast. And every time they would take the cast off, her foot would be deformed. And so she went through a series of casts and recasts, and the foot would never heal properly. So I think she spent more and more time in the house, maybe even bedridden for prolonged periods of time. Rhoda Wise further reported that in August 1939, St. Therese miraculously healed her injured foot, causing the heavy cast on it to split and fall off in the process. She received a locution from Teresa, get up, and she got up, and that's when that report that she gave witness to uh, that the uh, one of the several casts that she wore it broke open the medical community uh, was quite skeptical of rhoda wise's claims of have experienced miraculous healings of both her abdominal wound and her her foot rhoda on the other hand was adamant very adamant that what she had experienced with her abdomen and with her foot, these were actually miraculous healings. From 1939 to 1948, 
Rhoda said that she experienced regular apparitions of Jesus and St. Therese, including a visit by St. Therese on January 2nd, the saint's birthday, every year. Rhoda reported visions totaling 28. In her final apparition of Jesus on June 28, 1948, Rhoda said that Jesus asked her to say the rosary daily for the conversion of Russia. She woke to a light in her room. And when she turned to see what it was, Jesus was sitting in a chair by her bed. And she wasn't surprised that he was there because she was expecting to die. She went to touch him, and that's when he was gone. Rhoda Wise was inspired by these visions to offer herself as a victim soul to save the souls of others, particularly priests and members of religious orders. She was one who embraced suffering, that suffering became redemptive, and um, people were drawn to her. They were drawn to her holiness, to her fidelity. It was during the war years, during the Second World War, um, and Rhoda offered that suffering for priests. That's, you know, she suffered a lot of different kinds of things, but that suffering from the stigmata, she suffered for priests. On Good Friday, April 3rd, 1942, stigmata appeared on Rhoda's forehead and continued to appear and bleed at intervals over the next two years. In 1943, stigmata appeared on her hands as well as her feet and her forehead. The bleeding stigmata were witnessed by many visitors to the Rhoda Wise home. The crown of thorns bled profusely and she was in pain. Uh, Monsignor Habig allowed people to witness her bleeding. Rhoda was uh, claiming that uh, Jesus told her that she would suffer these additional sufferings, that uh, she would have the uh, stigma on a regular basis, and uh, which uh, there's evidence that she did experience the uh, bleeding from her eyes and her hands. And there's evidence of, of the bleeding from uh, the dresses that she wore. She gives witness to that, you know. And others witnessed it too, as you read the books about her. People that administered to her wounds, uh, people that uh, helped bandage her and so on. All of a sudden, it was gone. They could not believe it. We don't have any evidence of, you know, that she did anything to cause any harm to herself to cause this bleeding. Uh, we never saw any evidence of any financial gain from any of these uh, claims or activities. Bishop McFadden um, kind of took a wait and see approach. He was just exercising prudence because sometimes we can overreact and get caught up in the moment. I think that we always have to defer to, to, a, to a process of understanding and of scrutiny. The stories of Rhoda Wise's experience spread far and wide, causing hundreds of people to write to her and visit her home seeking physical healing and other spiritual help. Large crowds also gathered outside the Rotowise home on nights when she said that she was experiencing an apparition. When the apparitions were occurring or when they were thought to be occurring, people would, would come out and be outside the home. So um, she responded to grace and that grace became contagious and others were drawn into it. They went in thousands to look at her, you know, lined up uh, outside waiting to view her and she allowed that to happen for the sake of giving witness to the meaning of suffering. Thousands in that tiny little house is not much bigger than this room. Why? Why would you do this? What would be the gain for her? I mean, obviously she was not in great health anyway, so she would get fatigued she would be emotionally fried, but she kept doing it. Many people credited Rhoda Wise with miraculous cures after they had visited her home or received holy water from her home, and she developed a reputation as a miracle worker. I grew up in North Canton, which is just five miles from here. One day, we had the opportunity, my, myself, and I believe my mother was with me. We took her down to visit Rhoda Wise. She was uh, in bed and uh, she showed me her uh, her healing. It's uh, one of the most interesting days of my life. It takes time to, to look at a story, to 
behold the grace and to really understand everything that happened. In 1943, Rita Rizzo, a Canton teenager who later became known as Mother Angelica, was taken to see Rhoda Wise by her mother, seeking a cure for Rita's painful chronic stomach condition. I believe Rhoda said, I want you to pray in Novena, and uh, Mother did. Mother had such a troubled life, and it was the first time she really felt um, God's touch upon her, and it changed everything for her to feel that love and um, just changed her whole attitude about life and everything and led to her vocation. At the end of nine days of prayer, Rita's stomach condition suddenly disappeared. She eventually went on to become a nun and then the foundress of EWTN, the world's largest Catholic television network. Inexplicably, this rather in-depth uh, physical problem resolved itself. And mother felt a calling. If there hadn't been a Rhoda Wise, there wouldn't have been a Mother Angelica because her healing led to her vocation and EWTN. Even till this day, many people come looking for cures and um, spiritual help. After suffering a stroke, Rhoda Wise died of hypertension on July 7, 1948, in her Canton home. During the two days prior to her funeral, over 14,000 people reportedly visited her. Monsignor uh, Habig, uh, who was the pastor at the time, was very receptive to her. I mean, he had been, in the spirit of our Holy Father, accompanying her. He brought her into the faith, and uh, obviously he found her to be credible. He found her to be a woman of faith. Monsignor was very vocal about his support for Rhoda, which has been a great blessing. Um, and he, and he stood before everybody and said that he believed that um, she was now walking with her beloved Jesus and Little Flower. She's my grandmother. I was born on her birthday. When someone comes there and prays that with their heart and believes that our Lord and my grandmother could ask him for miracles, you know, they believed this and they left they left believing, and some got their miracles. I do remember a lot of the uh, crowds outside, you know, with busloads of people, and they would be standing in our front yard and all the way around and um, waiting for our Lord to come. She was very, very patient, and she loved the people that came. There are four main stages in the path to sainthood. When a cause is first opened, the candidate is termed a servant of God. Then when their life of heroic virtue is recognized by Rome, they are considered venerable. When one miracle through their singular intercession is found and validated by Rome, they are declared blessed that a second miracle makes them a saint. In November 2012, the Diocese of Youngstown began to conduct an internal investigation into the life and writings of Rhoda Wise to determine if she might be considered for sainthood. I represent the bishop as the Episcopal delegate in the investigation that we are conducting as a tribunal uh, under his auspices as bishop uh, regarding the uh, possible canonization of Rhoda Wise. You know, we're in the process now where Holy Mother Church is really looking at it and uh, with the hope that we can move this process forward so that one day, God willing, we can say, Saint Rhoda Wise. The primary focus of uh, the possibility of being named venerable by the Holy Father, of course, is whether or not the person demonstrates a certain holiness of life, if that can be shown without any reasonable doubt, whether or not the person lived an heroic life. In 2016, Bishop George V. Murray of the Diocese of Youngstown declared Rhoda Wise a servant of God as a first step towards her possible canonization as a saint in the Catholic Church. What Rhoda Wise does for us is she points us to the cross, 
and there can be no one can be a disciple without the cross. In July 2018, the results of the diocesan investigation were submitted to the Vatican. The cause is working on the Positio Now, an academic position paper which details the research of the cause into the life and virtues of the candidate for sainthood. Someday, if the Vatican's Congregation for the Causes of Saints declares that Rhoda Wise lived a life of heroic virtue, she will be declared venerable. The Dicastery for the Cause of Saints continues to look at this um, along with um, the help of our tribunal and we allow this to unfold over time. I think um, when you look at her life of suffering and how she embraced it, I find it to be very uh, heroic, inspiring, uplifting. Two miracles found through her intercession and validated by Rome will lead to her beatification and then canonization. The miracles must be medical healings of a serious condition, not liable to go on their own. The cure must be instantaneous, complete, and lasting. And perhaps most difficult of all, there can be no medical treatment that relates to the cure. The miracle is kind of the proof of the pudding. I'm putting it in a rather layman terms, but I think that's the best way to put it. And then sainthood requires still another miracle too. You know, so again, another proof of the pudding, so to speak. Mark and Betsy's story um, is a great favor. Everything changed for that situation. Mark Schoeg was diagnosed with stage four sarcoma in 2018. His prognosis was grim. I would say that if somebody asked me, do I believe in miracles? I would say, A, I haven't thought about it much. And uh, B, um, if push came to shove, probably not. Physician who was a uh, chief of urologist at a uh, well-known hospital in this area, um, he told me he did not believe it was my prostate. He sent me for an MRI. I know that MRIs usually take about 15 minutes. I was in the on the MRI table for at least an hour and a half, which I knew was not a good sign. So I had you know, always been reasonably strong, but things that I could do before were becoming more difficult. He said, you have uh, something like 45, 47 tumors in your lung that have broken off from the massive tumor in your abdomen, that the tumor in your abdomen has invaded your bladder, your liver, uh, your colon, and your prostate. and. Um, you have a choice of uh, not doing anything and just um, sort of getting your things together for hospice and saying goodbye, or we could put you on, uh, you know, high dose chemotherapy, which um, would probably buy you a few months. I saw how many tumors there were. Um, once I saw that, my jaw dropped. I felt hopeless and devastated. I had three straight days of eight hours straight of that chemotherapy. And um, I have never been that weak. I, I, I mean, I could not speak. Chemotherapy left him with all kinds of additional complaints. Chronic fatigue syndrome, unable to walk long distances, shortness of breath, hypertension, tachycardia, uncontrollable sweat, unable to eat solid foods, unable to sit upright and other health issues. I was feeling like um, uh, torn between, okay, I'm gonna stick this out for six months to, um, you know, it wouldn't be so terrible if I died in my sleep tonight. You know, when you're suffering, you want to, or at least I did, wanted to hear of, um, something to give you hope or even just somebody who else has been in the same situation and betsy would read to me uh Rona wise's diary he just continued to deteriorate rapidly and um i looked at him i knew he was dying clinically i i work in the icu he was dying i was praying every single day asking god to guide me through every single day and one day, I just said, I have to go down to Rhoda Wise. And I was going to bring Mark with me, 
I could not get him in the car. He was too sick. I couldn't even stand him up. So I thought, you know what? I'm going to take his sweaty T-shirt and I'm going to put it on the chair that Jesus sat on at Rhoda Wise's home. And, and that's how I will get Mark to Rhoda Wise. Literally, not him, but the shirt that he wore, that he sweated through. So that's what I did. When she came, um, she tearfully brought the her husband's shirt and, and set it on our Lord's chair and, and begged for his life. And um, our Lord obviously heard. I remember just her, you know, bringing the shirt to me. And I remember, most I remember her affect. And I remember feeling a little stronger. And I kept saying to myself, boy, I'd love to go to the, <laughs> I'd love to go to a supermarket so I could maybe see somebody, you know? And she looked at me, she probably thought I was crazy. And I said, no, we're going to the supermarket. He stood up, like he really did. I couldn't believe it. It had been months yeah. since he was able to walk. He had not even been to the bathroom without the use of a wheelchair, a tilt back wheelchair. I mean, it truly was miraculous. When I pulled up to the door, He's like, I want to go. And I thought, I'll get the wheelchair. He said, I don't want the wheelchair. I just re re remember thinking, I can't believe it. I finally had a different day. The doctor was absolutely stunned because the last time that he saw Mark, Mark was so sick, he couldn't even sit up straight. Now, Mark was actually able to walk himself in without using any support in and out of the doctor's office. He was truly dying. And um, it is a miracle. How do you go from from that to this? I'm almost five years out from six to 12 months. And what was, you know, well over 50 tumors has shrunk down to five. And, um, you know, now they're talking about it possibly being a chronic disease instead of something that kills me. I have a quality of life that I never thought I'd have. I see my grandkids uh, play basketball. We've seen our son uh, graduate high school. These things were not supposed to happen. I went from somebody who believed that science could explain everything and that we would get all the answers to somebody who now, who now believes that science cannot explain everything and, and, and that there are miracles. Anytime anyone reaches out to me for help because they know of our journey, I do tell them go to Rhoda Wise and believe in Rhoda Wise. I mean, his experience is, is miraculous. What else can I say? I mean, that's just what it is. Rhoda Wise uh, sainthood will be determined by uh, experts in the Vatican, but I, I firmly believe that Rhoda Wise is a, is a saint. I think Rhoda Wise was a disciple in the true sense of the word. I believe that uh, someday, uh, through God's grace and the uh, interest of the people, she will become a saint. To have uh, had the privilege of being there to see her and to uh, speak to her and uh, and then, of course, to to follow her uh, her life uh, down through the through the uh, years and uh, what's happening in her case. So I pray that uh, I think it would just be a wonderful uh, thing. I can't make that call, but if I were a betting man, I would say, yes, yeah, she's with our Lord. She's going to be a saint. I have no doubt about it. No one, no one that only God could know what she went through and she did it for him and for us for the people of of canton um this is something that um is beyond words i believe Rhoda's is a saint because of all the petitions that i bring to her every day whether they're small or large i have gotten um surprising and wonderful answers um I believe she's a close friend. She's a saint. This has been They Might Be Saints. I'm Michael O'Neill. Thanks for watching.
welcome back. I hope that you enjoyed this premiere of the program you just saw. They might be saints, road of wise. Now, you can watch it again tomorrow. It'll be on at 10.30 a.m. Eastern Time here on EWTN. And it'll be anytime on, at, we go to the on demand dot EWTN dot com, on demand dot EWTN dot com. And you can watch it there anytime. Now, you can also pre order a DVD copy for yourself by, from our EWTN religious catalog. Just go to EWTNRC.com. It is item number HDRW, so high definition, proto wise, HDRW. And it should be ready to ship to you by July 21st. Now, what I'd like to do is welcome in the producer of this series, they might be saints. Mr. Michael O'Neill. Michael, how you doing? Great. It's good to be with you. Same here. Same. Good to have you with us. Um, let me ask you this. Uh, th there are some really wonderful folks out there. What drew you to do this show on Rhoda Wise? Why would you pick her? Well, I've been interviewing Karen Sigler, the director of the Rotowise Shrine, on my radio show for many years. Oh, and we've okay. often talked we've often talked about doing an episode of They Might Be Saints about Rotowise. And of course, uh, people know me as the Miracle Hunter, and perhaps there's no one else in the United States. Uh, they have a whole house there called the Miracle House of Miracle Home of Rotowise. And uh, her her healings, her stigmata, her visions, the cure of uh, Rita Rizzo, future mother Angelica. All those things, plus the uh, the path to sainthood, all wrapped together, makes for a remarkable story, as you saw in this episode. So I think that right. it has some aspects that uh, not every sainthood cause has, and uh, that's particularly of interest to me. Okay, all right. Um, I've been able to go to uh, Rhoda Wise's home. Um, you know, I went there once, and and people are still welcome to go there. Correct. Absolutely. And you saw from the old black and white photos, the hundreds or thousands of people who would line up to see Rhoda Wise while she was still alive. So it was a real phenomena. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, if people can still go there and uh, observe, the, the, see the place and visit on the inside. In, in terms of the, the long-term effect uh, this is truly uh, a profound one. There's a double long-term effect. One is on the life of Rhoda Wise herself. She truly experienced a spiritual development, growth, and deepening through all of her experiences, correct? Absolutely. Uh, Rhoda Wise uh, went from being a non-believer. She was a Protestant and through her healing in the hospital and her time in the hospital with the sisters, uh, she learned uh, the devotion to St. Therese. She learned the rosary, devotion to the Sacred Heart. Her, her eyes and her heart were opened up uh, to the Catholic faith and that absolutely changed her. And then she had these remarkable experiences, uh, the suffering and the visions of Jesus and St. Therese and, and the miracles that happened there. Uh, it was an absolute transformation and uh, it was an incredible change. And uh, she sets an example for all of us, uh, the way she uh, dealt with suffering and the way she offered her suffering. It was uh, a remarkable life. Yeah, one of the things, uh, two things I'd like to bring up. The first is her suffering had begun well before her conversion. Uh, dealing with an alcoholic husband is itself very difficult. And then to have that tumor uh, weighing 39 pounds, that, that's, uh, that's just a remarkable amount of weight to be carrying with you. Um, and so she, her suffering had started before her conversion, 
but it led to her conversion. And it's important that even though she had a great conversion to Christ, that did not mean that the, sudden, the, the suffering all of a sudden disappeared. Sometimes people expect that to happen. Well, you believe in Jesus, now the suffering should go away. But that's not always the case now, is it? Yeah, she, she's the prime example of that. She uh, united her suffering to Christ. She offered her suffering mm -hmm. uh, for priests and, and religious, she said. And uh, it was an incredible life of suffering. And then the stigmata was uh, an, another issue. And we'll, perhaps we'll talk more about that. But uh, starting on a Good Friday uh, that lasted for perhaps three years during the war. And uh, it was uh, an incredible thing that people lined up to see that. But she was in tremendous agony suffering the wounds of Christ. So uh, her suffering did, did not go away. Right. And, and I think uh, especially when you have some programs which tend not to be on EWTN, where people say, well, just believe in Jesus and all your problems go away. I, I, I just don't think that's the way that life always works. For some people, it does. But for others, there's this union with Christ in his suffering. And, and to see that union especially being perfected during Holy Mass which is the sacrifice of Calvary represented. She joined herself and united herself with Christ in that self-gift. Absolutely. She's such a great model, and that's the whole point of sainthood in the first place. We uh, look to these uh, future saints and saints as intercessors, but we also look for them, look to them as models of, of the way they live their lives to help us with our faith journey. So I think Rhoda Wise is a, is a great person to be considered for sainthood. A sec the second point that, was, uh, uh, that hit me from watching this is the importance of those sisters who were good nurses, and I don't know if any of them were actually medical doctors. Sometimes sisters are also medical doctors. Oftentimes they were nurses and administrators of the hospitals. But they always had that sense and stories about the Vincentian nuns here in Birmingham and other nuns around the world are the same, that while they are there to help you with the healing of your body and they really are professional at doing all that their bigger concern is the salvation of your soul and that really came across in the case of Rhoda Wise I think so I think they uh, of course uh, tended to her physical needs to try to uh, heal her sure. But they took that opportunity to present uh, these devotions of the of the Catholic faith, the rosary, the sacred heart devotion, and the devotion to St. Therese. I think mm -hmm. all those things, uh, they seem to have an appeal to Rhoda Wise, and those, those nuns presented them to her. And it was a, a short turnaround, uh, uh, only a couple months, as it were, that she uh, was introduced to these things, and she wanted to become Catholic. So those, uh, those nuns played a huge role in the conversion of Rhoda Wise, which led to uh, the time with uh, Rita Rizzo and her healing and the Mother Angelica story as well. So those nuns perhaps were the starting point for all of it. Uh, the, another case of the nuns being so instrumental in healing um, is not for someone who you'll have on your show, they could be saints, but uh, John Wayne, the actor, had been dying of cancer and it was a nun who just was kind to him. And then when he finally asked her, what makes you tick? She evangelized him and he became a Catholic on his deathbed. Again, he's probably not going to be a for canonization, but he's, you know, it's more the, the, the wonders of these sisters. That's very, very important in these uh, people's lives. Now, something that you uh, wanted to bring up, and I think we should, is the stigmata. Tell us a little bit more about Rhoda Wise's stigmata. Yeah, and I think uh, for those people who aren't familiar with the term stigmata, and of course, watching the episode, you certainly would be, 
uh, is that uh, these are people who, through some mystical connection to the wounds and the suffering of Christ, manifest on their own body those same wounds. So these are uh, wounds in the hand or wounds in the side or wounds in the feet or the crown of thorns wounds. Or in the case of Rhoda Wise, uh, she had bleeding eyes as well. So it's, it's somewhat of a, a strange phenomena. But well, we have this starting with uh, St. Francis of Assisi being the first, Padre Pio, uh, Petrosina being the perhaps most famous modern stigmatic. But uh, there have been several hundred cases uh, throughout church history, and Rhoda Wise is one of these. And uh, her, her stigmata was started on a Good Friday, uh, happened between the hours of 12 and 3 p.m., and it was witnessed by many thousands and thousands of people. Uh, so this is an interesting phenomenon, and it has to be taken into account when they look at her sainthood cause to determine whether or not that is a believable thing, that she was, in fact, suffering the wounds of Christ. Yeah, I was just taking a quick look here at Galatians 6, <laughs> and this is where St. Paul also mentions that he has the marks of Christ on his body. And the Greek word that I have here in my copy is the word stigmata, that this word is a biblical term for experiencing the wounds of Christ. And St. Paul claimed to have those wounds of Christ in his own body. And he very much bragged about that. Yeah, it's an interesting point. It's a debated, uh, debated question whether St. Paul was in first, was at, was the first stigmatic, in fact, because of this, uh, this reference that you point out. Mm -hmm. uh, others will point to St. Francis as being the first, but perhaps St. Saint Paul's wounds were a, uh, an, an internal suffering or a metaphor for suffering, or they were actually actual wounds. So mm -hmm. that's been a debated point for sure. Yeah, and Lord knows after being beaten with rods, uh, beaten with whips, put in prison, shipwrecked, robbed by uh, thieves, and uh, all the other adventures that he describes as uh, part of his service to the church. Um, he certainly would have had some wounds, and whether it's the mystical uh, stigmata or making reference to all these wounds, which he also joined to Christ on the cross. That's the point of mentioning them. Uh, he gloried in the cross, and he was not of the mentality that, uh, well, you know, now that I'm saved and I'm a follower of Christ, everything goes well. It's just the opposite. Multiple occasions and multiple epistles he bragged about his suffering because he had united those sufferings with Christ yeah it's a, it's an amazing thing and then uh, Rhoda Wise is our more modern example of this and uh, that was detailed in the program the way she united her suffering uh, to the suffering of Christ so uh, we have a, a modern stigmatic as well so uh, it's it's this, an amazing yeah. thing this is a very, very important part of it. Um, it's also uh, uh, good that you were able to include family members. Uh, these are uh, grand grandchildren by adoption. She had adopted uh, two girls. One, as you mentioned in the documentary, one of them died in infancy. I mean, talk about another suffering. Uh, she wanted to have children. She adopted a child, and then that child died. Um, that, you know, that, that's always a horrendous uh, experience for any parent, and, you know, an extra level of frustration and suffering that the adopted child dies in infancy. Yeah, you, you, you mentioned that uh, her suffering went beyond just physical suffering with the 39 pound tumor and the, the broken foot, but uh, she had the alcoholic husband and she had a daughter who died in infancy. So I think she, her suffering was uh, on, on many levels. Absolutely. But you included the uh, surviving, uh, from the surviving child 
who grew up and had children and, and then grandchildren for Rhoda Wise. Uh, it, it's, it really came across that the family has a sense of share uh, in this mission of Rhoda Wise. They see that their promotion of her cause, uh, from the evidence you present, this is a way for them to have a sense of being part of the mission and welcoming people to know more about Rhoda and her suffering and Christ who appeared to her and St. Therese of Lisieux who appeared to her. Absolutely. And I think through the uh, work of Mother Angelica, the home of Rhoda Wise was preserved and people can still visit Canton, Ohio, uh, even today to see this home. And it's a remarkable place for people who are seeking miracles on their own or just want to get a sense of the life of Rhoda Wise. It's an incredible place to visit. I had been wanting to visit it for many years and it was a blessing to be able to film there and to experience the home of Rhoda Wise myself. So I encourage people to travel to Canton to see that if they have the opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you know, I've I knew Mother Angelica since '84, and uh, as I got to know her uh, better, she would talk more about Rhoda Wise. And one of the things that you know she had said in a conversation is that, as a matter of fact, in multiple conversations with Mother. She would talk about how her initial attitude towards her own suffering, her father abandoning her and her mother when she was two and a half or so, um, the poverty they had, sometimes all they had to eat was crackers and some salami. In those days, salami was a very cheap meat. Now it's a little more expensive, but in those days it was real cheap. They could hear rats inside the walls and all this. And her reaction was, you know, she didn't like God. She didn't like the church. And she really did not like the nuns. You know, she had gone to a little bit of Catholic school. And because her family, her, her parents were divorced, they singled her out, and she was embarrassed by them. They weren't nice to her, uh, all this. And I think that bitter reaction to her suffering was another element that got healed as Mother got to know Rhoda Wise, who grew in holiness through her suffering. I think that's an important connection. And I think an interesting point to make that isn't covered in the documentary is that uh, Rhoda continued to stay in touch with uh, with uh, Rita Rizzo, and they and she saw her as sort of a spiritual mother. Uh, there was a, a connection, a bond, and she would visit the home more often than that just that one time. So uh, I think that uh, Rhoda Wise and uh, Mother Angelica continued uh, to have a very special bond throughout the years. Yeah, uh, so much so that uh, Rhoda deeded her house to EWTN. And um, I, I recall when that, when that happened, uh, EWTN had possession of her house from 2001 to 2015. But that's not the case now. You know, I think that has changed now, but, uh, but certainly with the support of Mother Angelica and EWTN, that house was able to be preserved. And if you visit the home, you can see the, you know, the cast that uh, fell from her foot or those yes. uh, relate the, the painting that was made through the instruction of Rhoda Wise and uh, in the holy water there, the chair that Jesus was said to sit on. So all these artifacts or relics, as you might call them, are still there. So uh, it's really a, a very special experience to, to go to the home of Rhoda Wise. Right, right. And it's the is it this uh, the, the who owns the house now is this a rotowise foundation 
Uh, there is a foundation and uh, you'd have to go to the website uh, rotawise.com to find out all the information about the ownership of the house and the details there. Mm -hmm. But uh, all I can say is that I was so happy to be there and to witness it uh, all myself, but uh, the exact uh, details are unknown to me. Okay, okay. Yeah, I'm not sure uh, who exactly know, owns it now, but um, you know, when I did go to visit it, it was not long after EWTN had been given the house, so uh, it was uh, a great privilege to to see it. In terms of the the future of the cause, what's what's going to be the next step? Well, as uh, was mentioned in the episode, there are four steps in sainthood. Uh, right. Servant of God, Venerable, Blessed, and Saint. And so currently, Rhoda Wise is in that first slot of Servant of God, where her cause has been opened, and all the and the diocesan level, they've co collected all her writings, uh, mm -hmm. they've interviewed people who, who knew her, uh, they collect all the details of her life and put it in a positio, and that's being prepared to be sent to Rome. And the position paper, known as the Positio is this giant book of documentation that will take Rome, you know, five, 10, 20 years to sift through. And then they will make the declaration of whether she lived a life of heroic virtue and call her a venerable if that's what the decision is. So that's what everybody is hoping and praying for. But you can see even her uh, portrait is uh, up there in the in the basilica. And uh, you don't see many uh, lay people with their, their portraits uh, in, a, in a basilica who aren't yet uh, blessed or saints. So it's a, it's a pretty remarkable thing to see the support of the diocese there. Uh, that's, yeah, they, they, they really do seem to be, um, you know, uh, interested in this and committed to it. Um, and that's, that's an important part of going through this process. And when you say that it might take a few years yet, you know, it's important for folks to be aware that the process for uh, be becoming a venerable and then blessed and canonized saint is done with great care. It's not like, oh yeah, we gotta, you know, knock some saints off the um, uh, assembly line and just sort of, you know, get them out there into the public. It's not like that. They want to make sure that everything that the saint wrote was orthodox. You know, it might not be a complete ex uh, explanation of the faith. Not every saint is Thomas Aquinas. And even he didn't understand everything. <laughs> but it has to be true. It has to be solidly orthodox. And then to look for not just, well, that, this is a nice person, but rather to look for someone who is heroically virtuous, that they, are, they live a life of virtue that shows heroism that you can say yeah you ought to if you're going through suffering and you have an alcoholic husband and you have these physical pains you might want to learn something from rhoda wise so that's that'd be the part of the process absolutely i think they they overturn every rock and do all the research they possibly can to make sure that the person that they're proposing for sainthood has lived that life of heroic virtue and that's what the cause is currently working on today, gathering all that documentation, all that testimony, and putting it in that uh, positio to send to Rome. And then it'll be in the hands of Rome and the Congregation for the Causes of Saints to see if Rhoda moves on to the next step. And then they'll begin the search for miracles, uh, two okay. miracles uh, to get you to sainthood. Then they can put you on your next show. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you. We've run out of time. Again, it's They Might Be Saints, Rhoda Wise. Watch them again July 7th at 10.30 a.m. Eastern Time or anytime at On Demand. Now, may Almighty God bless you, Michael, and all of our audience, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God bless you all, and thank you.